Huffman coding as a, an optimal way to generate a prefix tree, a prefix code for an alphabet in some ways. Okay, so yeah, we, we talked about weighted averages, we talked about prefix trees, um, this idea of the tree and going left to right in a tree maybe could correspond to zero, one and generate these letters. Uh, by the way, when we talk about the average length of code word, we're also, also talking about the average height of all the nodes in the tree, uh, weighted by how probable they, each one is, all the leaves on the tree. Okay, so uh, if you start out, you're going to say, hey, what is a, what's the best way we can do it? And again, like we, we mentioned, hey, maybe you should put the most common letter up at the root. Uh, yeah, that can be okay, uh, but it's not clear that you always want the one most common letter at the root. A good counterexample is if all your letters are evenly distributed, except one is slightly, slightly smidgen more likely than the others. Gosh, you're, you could put that at the root, uh, but again, if you make that letter, say, E, uh, put it at the root and have a 1 be E, all the other letters will be zero. All your other 25 letters become one bit longer. And E, which was only slightly more common, uh, became really short. Yeah, it's probably not going to be a win to make almost everything longer and only one thing shorter, even if you make it four characters shorter. So, gosh, um, maybe put the most common letter at the root only if it's twice as popular as the most next popular. Yeah, so you can start going off and trying to figure out all sorts of ways of doing this. Um, but Huffman coding, uh, David Huffman came up with the answer. I'll have a little anecdote about that. Uh, his key insight, the lowest priority letters must be at this tr prefix tree. The two least common letters must be at the very bottom. They must be as far down as anything else. If not, you could make a better tree. Okay. Um, and once you have, if you have two, uh, two nodes at the bottom of your tree, uh, really, you can sort of say, hey, this occurred 1% of the time, this occurred a half percent of the time. Together, they occur 1.5% of the time. So once you know they're at the bottom, you know that put them together, put a little root above them, and say, hey, this node, this tree here, occurs 1.5% of the time. Let, let's look at a picture. I think that really makes things a lot clearer. So I'm going to again go to this a website. I'll put the URL down in the... Uh, text below. Da, da, da. Okay, so here's a place I'll put in some letters and frequencies. I just use A through F. Okay, and if we look here, you can uh, maybe see, gosh, I probably can't zoom in, can I? It's bigger. There we are. Okay, we're going to start with six trees, <laughs> all with a single node in them. So six different trees, and we're going to keep track of the letter and its frequency. And here's what we're going to do. We're going to say, hey, I know that the smallest two should be joined together at the bottom. So first of all, they go ahead and sort these things. Uh, they find the smallest two and say, great, let's make a new B and F for the least common letters in what I entered here. So let's make a new letter called BF. Okay, it's our best friend letter. Uh, and say, now we have five trees with probably with a uh, Occurrence rates of 271, 379, the sum of these two, 432. Okay. Again, you can think of these as being percentages if you want, if you just normalize it. Okay. Great. Now do the same thing. Find your two least common letters. They should be at the bottom. So join them in a tree. Okay. So now we've joined C along with this meta letter BF. And now we have a new letter, CBF. Okay. A chummy best friend. And D occurs 432, this CBF occurs 650, A occurs 812, E 999, okay. So we can go ahead and join those. Um, so far we've all been joining them onto one tree, uh, but notice that eventually like, hey, 1082, this is the, the weight of all these letters combined, right? And that is now as bigger than either A or E alone. And so now A and E, we're gonna go ahead and say, hey, join those two, okay? And now we have two, we're down to simply two of these meta letters, and we join those, okay? And we're going to get this tree here, okay? And this is uh, kind of nice. I can go ahead and, 
This will be my prefix tree. I think the simulation even goes and sort of shows us putting zeros and ones in here. Da, 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 da. Step, 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 step. Okay. Um, and now we can sort of say, hey, A is going to be one zero. Uh, B would be zero one one zero. Okay, so it's going to be all a long, we have a very long keyword for B because it occurs very frequently. We have short keywords for A. A occurs a lot, and so we'll get there pretty quickly. Okay. Um, and I've, eventually it will give us the table at the end of this. Here we are. Here's the table. They cut off A in this simulation. Oh, well. Uh, B is going to be 0110, has a frequency of this, and takes four bits. See, And now you can compute this weighted average, and this weighted average you can prove, and this is what Huffman did in his paper, you can prove that this is the minimal for any static distribution of characters. Okay, so yeah, that's how we go ahead and do it. Let's go ahead and try it ourselves. Um, let's go back to our editor. Uh, let's go ahead and take A through H with these probabilities here. I'm going to go ahead and just divide everything by 100 to keep our uh, lives simple. Okay, so we go through this, this chart here. Uh, what are the two common letters? Find them and make, we're going to make a new node uh, by combining those. Two small celebrities, like G is 20 and F is 22, B is 14, here we are. B and G are the small cells. So we're gonna make a new letter, a new node called BG. I'm gonna view this as a new meta letter, okay? And uh, what do I have? Um, 20 plus 14 is 34. With frequency 34, okay. Now we're gonna go ahead and you know remove these. Say okay, we've handled B, we've handled the G. Remove those lines, uh, so we can ignore them. Now take the smallest two numbers: 81, 27, 42, 27. Okay, 22 is pretty good. 22 and 27. Okay, so C and F. Uh, 22 and 27 is 49. Okay, so we have a new. Get rid of those. We have a new meta letter called CF. Okay, so now I'm thinking of a, of a forest where I have a singleton A, a singleton C, a singleton D, E, and H, and then two very small trees, B, G, and CF. Okay, now find the smallest two. Uh, this is a little bit differently different than we had before, but uh, the, it's different than that previous example where all our first five or so all made one long tree. Here we have two trees that are equal size. And now we're going to combine. So again, we look at the smallest that aren't X'd out. Uh, those are gone. So 42 is pretty small. 60, 42, and 34. Okay. 42 from D. So D and BG together. Um, debug. Okay. So 42 and 34 is 76. And we take off those. So at every moment, we're taking off two letters and adding one. So we're getting smaller every time around. Okay. 81, 127, 60, 60, and 49. Is that our smallest ones? Uh, you can sort of see uh, the algorithm kept the list sorted. You can see why that's kind of helpful for us to just grab the smallest two. If you're thinking the words priority queue, hey, I want to grab the smallest and then remove them and add some new things to a new priority. That sounds like a priority queue. Not that it, we're going to concern about the runtime of building this code. That's pretty inconsequential in most cases. Okay, so. Yeah, our two smallest numbers, we have a 60 and a 49. So we'll go ahead and bind H and CF to get 109. Okay. Um, oh, that's what I want. There we are. Okay. And now, uh, da -da -da, take off H, take off CF. And now we got a, maybe something a little bit more interesting. No, 76 and 81. We add A to DBG. Um, 81, 157, sounds right, take off that, take off that, and finally we're going to add two interesting trees, I think we have a 127, a 109, no, we don't do this in this example, okay, 
uh, 127 and a 109. Um, so it doesn't have to be the case that every time we add just one letter to an existing tree, uh, and I think that did come up in the previous one, sometimes you have two subtrees when you join those to entire subtrees, even if there are some still single letters in play at the moment. Okay, so we can take off 109 and 127, that's 227, 237, minus 1, 236. And then finally, uh, there's now there are only two things left, and we get all the letters A through G coming in at a weight of 380 and 13. Okay, uh, by the way, I can double check. Is 393, was that really the weight of all the original letters? And that's a good double check. I now have a tree, and I'm not going to... Again, I don't have a nice thing to draw it with, but this tree here says, yeah, I had A, G, and that was a combination of, again, I'll label that node, but I don't really care what the label is a whole lot, so just to help me keep track. That came out of A, D, B, G, and E, H, C, F. Uh, how did these trees get formed? I'm just going to do the first one. How did we get that A, D, B, G? Uh, A, D, B, G was from A and D, B, G, so I'm going to do an A and a D, B, G. So A is, my letter A is going to be zero, uh, start of the root. Go left, go left. A is going to be zero, zero. Okay. And let's just unravel the D, B, G tree. How did that D, D, D B, G get in there? Uh, its two children were D and B, G. So now we know that, hey, D is going to be a 0, 1, 0. Uh, B and G, we're going to get those code words in a second. Um, how do we get B, G? We combine B and G. Maybe we combine G and B, I don't know. Okay. But yeah, so now it can reverse engineer. So B might be 0, 1, 1, 1. Uh, zero one one zero. I noticed, by the way, I could have said GB or GB. Does that make any difference? Well, yeah, we'll swap the last bit of B and G here. In fact, when I made this tree debug, I could have said it's BG on the left and D on the right. So one thing to note when I'm making these uh, trees here, I'll leave again that whole EHCF, have to unravel that one. Um, they can now go and compute the average code length. Hey, what is the probability of A? And it take, took two characters to code encoded bits, uh, three encoded bits, four encoded bits, four blips, if you will. Um, and you can say now, say, hey, look at the weights for A, B, C, D, A, B, D, G. Uh, what is the average length of each code character, encoded character? Okay, so like I mentioned, there can be several different Huffman codes. Most of the time when you combine two trees, you have your total choice over left or right. So yeah, lots of choices there. Um, Occasionally there can be ties. So there can be three, uh, you know, or I guess uh, two things each have the second smallest weight or something like that. Uh, and you can say, hey, I have my choice of which three trees to combine. So that can also give you different. So there's not one canonical one. You can make up rules for how to resolve such ties if you want. Um, notice that if I am using this encoding here, uh, and now I'm going to send you a message full of zeros and ones, I probably need to tell you what my encoding is, especially if I just sort of made it up. There's not one standard, everybody's agreed, hey, this is the one standard Huffman encoding to use. Uh, you can use different ones, you can publish it in advance and say, hey, the uh, the Barlin code looks uses the following, uh, you know, 00 for A and 010 for D. Uh, or I might send you a message and I might have to include the dictionary at the start. Oh, excuse me. <laughs> God, that's a type. Me? Thank you. Bless you too. Um, so I might go ahead and send a dictionary along with my file where the first part is some sort of saying, hey, this is not, these zeros and ones of the message are somehow telling you what the letters need to be. Um, and then all the rest is the real message. Okay. Uh, how do you get that initial distribution? Well, we just went ahead and used a corpus of words taken from wherever you know we get them from. It might take all English language things, uh, you might go through your own emails. Hey, I'm going to go through all the emails of the last five years and develop a corpus from that. And now I can make something that's going to be tuned not for English in general, but for the words and letters that I use a lot. 
Okay, if I use the letter Z a lot, then hey, that's going to be better than using a general English language one for encrypting my own emails, maybe my future emails. Okay. Um, if you're using Finnish, yeah, your K okay, is suddenly going to be a very common letter in Finnish. So yeah, you'd want a different distribution there. Uh, if you're looking at encoding chemistry for chemistry articles, yeah, the words and letters used in a chemistry journal are going to be very different from general English. So you can even go ahead and say, hey, I have one particular message I want to send, and I'm going to go through that message and calculate its frequency, figure out a Huffman code, and now go ahead and prepend the dictionary and then send the code and have a pretty good, uh, pretty good system. Uh, especially if, say, the message I want to send is, you know, um, 10 of Shakespeare's selected works. Yeah, Shakespeare's letter distribution is going to be different than modern English. Um, so I can get a, something very finely tuned for the message I want to send. Okay, here's a couple of wacky ideas. Uh, you can go ahead and even change the code you're using halfway through. I mean, just think if you had a message that has a lot of stuff in English, then it has a big long section in Finnish, and then it has a, a, fin a chemistry article written in Finnish. Yeah, you might have some sort of extra bit sequence, byte sequence you build into your code saying, hey, uh, I'm about to send you a new dictionary, so the next bits are no longer zeros and ones of the message, they're a new dictionary, and then the regular part will resume. Um, or you can also just sort of say, hey, after every one megabyte, I'm going to send you a new dictionary. So those are some interesting little tweaks you can have on, on this system. Uh, let me finish on some bigger issues about Huffman codes. Uh, this is provably optimal if you know the letter distribution and every letter is independent of the next. That's not really true in a lot of things we want to send, okay? Um, so, gosh, if, I mean, in, in my general emails, when I write the letter Q, you can be pretty dang sure the letter U is probably following. May not be that way. Here's, in fact, in here, I have the letter Q followed by a tick mark. So it, it's not always true. But, yeah, uh, Gosh, letters don't really occur independently. I might be able to do better if I take into account correlations of words and patterns and there are common sequences that happens. In fact, we'll look at LZW encoding next, and which automatically does do that. Okay. Um, by the way, what about the fact that Q is always followed by U? What if I treat QU as uh, its own letter? Yeah, I could add a new letter called QU and have that be one of my things. I could keep Q separately as well and U separately. Uh, in fact, I could go and take every pair of letters and just generate a Huffman code based on pairs of letters. Now, my dictionary is much bigger. I don't have 26 letters. I have 26 squared letters. But yeah, you could, you could go ahead and do that. Um, even entire words, right? When I type things on my phone, uh, it tries to predict the next word for me, and it does pretty dang well. So, uh, so just keep in mind that Huffman is optimal in some sense uh, if letters occur independently and you know their frequency, uh, then it's optimal. Uh, you can maybe do even better. Uh, okay, see you next time.